but it would be fun, I thought. And in our signal groups, we can message if anything spoke to you. I have it up there. If you want it, what we can do is we'll lot, fire it off in the signal groups and maybe even put it up on Facebook or something uh, so you can see the exact plan. We'll try try to do that today. I'm looking at my family. Try, try to do that today. <clears throat> so we are in Acts chapter 3. Did I say Happy New Year? Yeah, I did. That's how bad 23 was. <laughs> no, it was not a bad year. There was bad things. But anyways, let's read down through. We're going to go from Acts 3, 1 through 12. <clears throat> and let's dig into the word. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat at begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them on the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And Father, we lift up this passage to you today, Lord. In the midst of Peter and John, there you are doing a work, healing, <laughs> touching, changing lives. Lord, you have not stopped. And Lord, it's a new year. We feel like it's a fresh start for all of us. And we want a fresh surrendering, a fresh filling from you today. Lord, let us not be stuck in what happened last year, but moving forward, Lord, as you would guide us. Lord, we look to you for power, for strength. We look to you, Lord, our God and Savior. And we ask that you would just fill this place with your presence. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as I looked at New Year, right, do I want to do a special new message? But you know what? The word is special enough. I don't have to try to invent or create. And as I went through this, the Lord spoke to me over and over again. Here's something for the new year, Matt, for you. So I will share as I go through what the Lord spoke to me is, here's what's in the new year for you, Matt. <clears throat> but as we begin, during World War II, a church in France was by, bombed by the Lutenbach. Lutenbach, that's the German Air Force. That's why I can't say it. It's German. I can barely do English. When the war concluded, the people in the community cleared away the rubble and found a statue of Jesus, at the base of which was inscribed these words, Come unto me, all ye that are weary. What was remarkably preserved, except for both hands which had been destroyed. Hearing of this, the sculptor whose work it was immediately offered to replace the hands, but the pastor wisely declined. And so it was that the statue was returned to the original position in front of the church, but with a new inscription that read, He has no hands on earth but ours for we are his body. I think that's a great story. We see that here. Peter and John are going to be the body of Christ, and they're going to take another man by the hand, I thought that was appropriate, and lift him up. So it says, Now Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer. It was the ninth hour. And when you look at Peter and John again, they are a very unique set of disciples to be put together. History would tell us more than likely Peter was older, probably 40s, maybe even 50s. Wow, that's so old, right? John, somewhere as late as they put 20s, but maybe even as early as a teenager. Some have even said as early as 15 years old. Here's these two guys walking up to the temple together. Peter, the impulsive one, right? 
jumping out on the water, charging into the tomb where John stood outside, looked and pondered. Now, John had his own problems, right? He was one of the sons of thunder. So I'm sure he had a little bit of a temper too. And I'm sure Peter could match it or even exceed it. But here are these two, this odd couple, right? Walking up to the temple together. And it reminded me that we are different people in different ages and different pasts and different cultures, but we have one thing in common that completely binds us, and that's Jesus Christ. And everything else is a detail. Everything else is a detail. He asked us to, to be bound together. He asked us throughout Scripture, we've seen that they were together. They were unified and that they were together and they were bound in purpose, direction, and love and bound by Jesus himself. In Acts, we've, we see that they're sent in teams of two. If you remember through the scriptures when he sent the 70 out, they're sent in teams of two. It's rare as you look through scripture, you see loners. Sometimes you do. You see, you see Jonah, right, and the whale. He was by himself, but look, he kind of pouted and, and had his little fits and probably could have used a, a partner at some point. But Elijah even had servants. Elisha had a servant. Throughout scripture, we see that there was usually two. And I was just reminded of Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's the marriage verse, right? We hear that in marriage over and over again. And again, just reminded of the Marines. When I was in the Marines, you always had a battle buddy. You never went anywhere alone. And if your platoon sergeant couldn't find you and they found him, they would want to know why are you alone without him? You always, always had a battle buddy. And we see that inscription or in scripture. Paul and Barnabas were together. Again, we see Peter and John. We'll see them again together. And throughout it, we see usually teams of two. And it just reminds us, me that we should have a battle buddy. For this is war. We are in war. If you haven't noticed, go watch the news for about three minutes and you'll quickly realize that this is not home and we are in a battlefield. So have a battle buddy. If you have a spouse, guess what? That's your battle buddy. And not a battle with buddy, a battle buddy. That is somebody you go to war with. You should also have and the Lord reminded this of me. He always has to remind me. You should have a battle buddy of the same sex too. Because men make men, right? We challenge each other. And I think women make women. And you challenge each other. And you know how to talk to each other because us men, we're very insensitive, right? We, we know that. We're aware. Um, but you you got to know how to talk to each other. Men know how to talk to each other to get each other's attention. So have a battle buddy. Have somebody to fight through this. Have somebody to pick you up when you fall down. Jesus did not send them out alone again. He sent him out two by two. So make sure you have somebody that you trust, that you can confess to, you can invest in, and will invest back in you. And for us guys, ladies, be patient with us. We're not proud or anything. We just know we can do everything by ourselves. So we're very confident of that. No, guys, have a battle, buddy. I, I, I feel like the women are so much better at it than us. Because, again, we are very proud, aren't we? And we don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be told how to do it. Just go get us something from Ikea, and the instructions will lay on the side as we put it together. We're very proud. <clears throat> but have a battle buddy, guys. <clears throat> they went up during the time of prayer, it says, and this was the custom of the Jews. The early church was very into the customs of, of still the Jewish day. They followed them. There was three times of prayer. It would be 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. The ninth hour would be 3 p.m. because they judged by 6 a.m. being the first hour of the day. And so they would go up to the, the 3 p.m. This would be the final time of prayer for the day at the temple, kind of the official closing out time. And this time consisted of 15 minutes of silence, 30 minutes of partitions, petitions, not partitions, and 15 minutes of adoration. So they would go up during this time and they would spend this time together. I think that's a good guideline to sit in silence before our God first, to bring him our, our I'm going to say petitions again, like, like we're divided. Bring him our requests. And then to be adoration. I think we miss the adoration a lot. A friend of mine just messaged this morning. Uh, 
another friend's discouraged again, talking about battle buddies. And one thing he said to them, discouragement, depression, anxiety cannot exist where there's a thankful heart. And if you have a thankful heart, none of that other stuff can exist there. Because if you appreciate what you have, if you appreciate what's been done for us, if you appreciate the cross, everything else is so small. So be in prayer. An effective church is a prayer-fueled church. The early church was marked with prayer and fasting. We have access to the very throne of God. You realize that he calls us his son, his child. We have access to come right before him to ask what we need. And through prayer, we show our dependence on God. C.S. Lewis would say, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time. Waking and sleeping, it doesn't change God. It changes me. Be in prayer. You want a New Year's resolution? Pray more. We can never pray enough, right? The scripture says pray without ceasing. You will always probably feel guilty. I didn't pray enough. Every Sunday I stand here and think, I did not pray enough about this. But pray. About people that are effective and used by God. Pray. Verses 2 and 3. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, Asked for alms. Arm, yeah, alms. This man had always been lame. He never knew what it was like to walk. And it's not like today, right? We have handicap ramps. We accommodate. We, we do everything we can to accommodate those who can't walk. You know, parking spots, everything else. In that day, there was no such thing. Can you imagine this being your life? Today, you know, handicap, they're, they're at least mobile for the most part. We have wheelchairs. We have electric wheelchairs now. You can see them even going down the road on scooters now. We, Eli and I watched one the other day, a guy on a scooter with a big American flag coming out the back, right? Like, we take care of them. But this, in this day and age, he was completely dependent on somebody picking him up and taking him. And it says he went to the temple daily. They would pick him up and lay him in front of the gate daily. This was his only means of funding. This was his occupation. Begging was his life, 100% dependent. And in, in 422, it says this man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. 40 years he'd been laying there. 40 years, picked up, taken to the gate, beautiful, and laid there. Probably at night they would come and bring him home. He couldn't go into the temple and laid outside of those gates. Those gates were about 75 feet high, huge double doors covered with Corinth bronze. The Corinth bronze exceeded the value of silver and gold. These were expensive, beautiful gates, and who wouldn't want to walk right through them? So he had the primo spot, I'm sure, for begging. He sat right where the best spot was, everybody walking through those gates so he could, he could beg like the gate beautiful. We know Jesus had taught at the temple grounds multiple times, which means more than likely this man being taken there daily, that Jesus had walked by him. Can you imagine that? You ever wonder why Jesus doesn't heal? Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes, again, in this predicament, he says, wait. But Jesus probably walked by him and saw him. He was a fixture there. For 40 years, he sat there. People would see him. They would know his name. They would see who he is. In the Jewish tradition, it was very uh, strong and, and, and considered a very act of righteousness to give alms to the poor. So I'm sure he was taken care of. I'm sure money was given to him. But there was this healer one time walking by. He didn't address him, and I'm sure that bothered him. Forty years laying there, I'm sure you've given up hope on praying for healing. But then when you hear about a healer and this healer doesn't come by, you probably wonder what. What happened? And there's sometimes Jesus says, wait, right? We talked about that before. Sometimes he says, wait, right now is not the time. I have something to do through you later, but now is not the time. Sometimes he says, no. Sometimes the greatest pulpit is, is from a wheelchair, and I think of Corey Tamboon, right? She said one time that if I could take anything to heaven, I would ask God if I could take my wheelchair. And then if I took my wheelchair up there, then and in heaven... I would stand at the edge of heaven, you know, I don't know if there's an edge of heaven, and she would say, Lord, I'm casting this right down to hell now in front of you, because she was tired of her wheelchair. <clears throat> I mean, Johnny Erickson Tata, I said, Corey Tim, 
Donnie Erickson Tata. That was her, her pulpit. So he, there he lays. He's a familiar sight passing by, and, and Peter and John walk by. And they stop, and it says they see him. He sees them, and he asks them for alms. And it says in verse 4, And fixing his eyes on him with John and Peter, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It's amazing, right? I love this story. Because here's Peter and John, they are displaying the very power that they were promised earlier. That they would see miracles, there would be signs, there would be wonders done through them. And here they are and they're doing them. It's interesting today, and and I know you guys never do it, but you pull up and there's the guy in the middle of the road with the sign, right? And what do you do? You probably look to your radio. Don't make eye contact, right? That's rule number one. And definitely don't speak because then you know you have to give something, right? And, And there's... Probably some wisdom in that, right? We don't know what they're going to spend the money on, and I hate to assume the worst on somebody, but sometimes it's true, right? Casey and I used to, when we went down to Baltimore, we would pack homeless bags. And we put granola bars and a little bottle of water and a track, and that's what we would give out. So so better to give that out. Here I'm giving you the word of God and and a little bit of of your need. I, I always hesitate giving money, but I also want to be flexible enough if the Lord tells me to that I would, right? Because sometimes we're we're used to our culture, right? We, we immediately, like I said, we assume the worst, but maybe it's not the worst. Maybe they are down on their luck. But Peter does something different than what we do when the person's on the corner. He fixes his eyes. It means he locked eyes with this guy. <clears throat> and first thing I have to know is they're on their way to prayer meeting. If I am on my way to prayer meeting, I am a very focused individual. It's time to go to prayer meeting, right? The sky here, that person over there, they don't matter. It's time to go to prayer meeting. But one thing the Lord has taught me, if you want to be used of the Lord, you've got to be flexible. Chuck used to say, blessed are the flexible, for they will not break. That was one of his Chuckisms. It was very, very common to say that. They were flexible, and they were sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You want to be led by the Lord, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, being flexible. So Peter said, fixes his eye on him, and then says, look at us. So we looked at him, and we get a little bit of insight of what the guy was thinking. Oh, they're going to give me money. Oh, here's dinner for tonight. And I'm sure the next words that comes out of his mouth, that the beggar was like, you can move along. Silver and gold, we have none. Hey, move along, guys. You know, there's a lot of other people coming through. I've got other people to beg from. Can you stop blocking the traffic? <clears throat> Isn't this a far cry from the name it and claim it crowd, right? Silver and gold, I have none. Sometimes I like to call them the grab it and blab it, blab it. Silver and gold, we have none. There was a story of a monk and a pope at one time walking through, I believe it was Vatican City, and they're looking at all the riches they had acquired. And I I can't remember which one, but one of them says, uh, it was the pope. The pope said, Look, at all, we can no longer say silver and gold, we have none. But the monk said, but we can no longer say, take up your bed and walk. We don't have that power anymore. When the church trades purity for prosperity, it loses its power. The power is found in purity. We want to be used by God this year, be pure. Peter didn't have much on him. He didn't have much to give, I'm sure. They were just walking up to the temple to pray. He said, but what I do have to give you. Many times today, I feel like we are very careful and cautious about what we say. I know I am at work. And there's some wisdom in that. It's also, this is the the world where media is king, right? You're recorded constantly, right? There are cameras on you almost everywhere you go. And if you do something silly, even fall off a step, that's probably going to be on some gag reel somewhere. <clears throat> you do something, hit another car, it's probably at the traffic stops and they're going to have it in court. Whatever we do, we're recorded and media is king. And I think we're all very aware of that. I think what that does to us as believers, it restrains us a bit. Because we're afraid to say it wrong, right? Peter said, what I do have, I give you. 
It didn't matter. He wasn't worried about the right words. He wasn't worried about having the right theology. He wasn't worried about what, how it came out or what was said. He simply stood boldly in faith and with the power of Jesus and proclaimed, stand up, rise up, and walk. <clears throat> You're going to be a person used of God this year. Be bold. <clears throat> Stop worrying about the way it comes out and say it as you're led. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of my favorite commentators used to say, I'm simply a beggar that have found bread and I'm trying to share it. And that's all we are. We are no different than this lame man who, who was there, poor and broken. We found healing and we're just trying to lead people back to the healer. So be bold. In this time, and in, in, in the biblical times, authority was found in a name. For instance, when we pray, most of the time I close in Jesus' name, amen. It means I'm closing in the authority of Jesus Christ. Many people would come and they will proclaim the name with authority. So when Peter says, rise up and walk, he's saying in the, what he's really saying, and people would understand this, in the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He's claiming that authority. I'm saying under this authority, I am rise up and walk. Beginning of last week, I closed out a seven-day devotional. I don't usually do the devotional things. I, I like to read it on paper. It was called Dangerous Prayers. And the name just intrigued me, so I read it. They got me. They totally suckered me right in. Dangerous Prayers. What does that mean? And so I did the seven-day Dangerous Prayers thing. And it really hit me. I'm sure it was led of the Lord. Because one thing it said in this Dangerous Prayers thing was, are you willing to pray to be broken? Are you willing to pray to be broken again? See, Peter and John had to be broken first before the Lord could use them. And Peter will have to be corrected again. We know at one point Paul is going to have to come to him and say, why are you doing this? Why are you eating you know, the, the, the pork and the bacon in front of the Gentiles? And then you go in front of the Jews and you dial it all back and start acting Jewish again. You know, he's going to have to get corrected again. And there's continuous of that, of reeling ourselves back in. But are you very, are you willing to take, to ask the Lord to break you again. That's what the Lord has been speaking to me. Because I'm so quick to get prideful again. I'm so quick to get comfortable again. Am I willing to ask him, Lord, search me out again? Is there a lameness I still have that I am unwilling to give over to you? Because I'm still a rotten sinner on the core. I'm just saved by grace. Am I willing Am I willing to pray big prayers? God is not limited. He has unlimited resources. Impossible is not in God's vocabulary. You want, you want to have a good year? You want to have a changed year? Pray impossible prayers. Pray impossible prayers. Don't limit God. This man wasn't looking for healing, but healing came to him. But he was at the right place. He was in front of the temple. And Peter and John found him and healed him. Again, they were sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But how do you become that sensitive to the Holy Spirit? That's always my question. How do they know? Because I don't want to walk around and see a guy in a wheelchair and pull him out and watch him fall over, right? That's my fear. I want to have that faith, Lord. But how do I know when to do that? And it goes back to Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. To be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we have to have these things in proper order. To be steadfast in, at them. To not stop, even when it feels like it. Really, this sermon in many ways is, at the end of it, you're going to see it's just surrender more. That's what I need to do in 2024. All these ways I'm explaining to you to be flexible, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I want to be a man of prayer more. It's to surrender more. I want in 2024 to be a man more surrendered than I was in 2020. Peter was now surrendered, we see here. And he had continued steadfastly. They were sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I believe here they were given a word of knowledge. I believe Peter was told, rise him up and walk. Tell him. In verses 7 and 8, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he 
leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. When Jesus heals, Jesus heals completely. There is nothing left. If you think about all the stories in Scripture where he had healed, he, he healed the man with the withered hand. It was completely healed. He healed the leopards. They were completely cleansed. The woman with the flow of blood, she touched him. She was instantly healed. The man at the pool of Bethesda, he was touched and he was healed. He was asked and he took up his bed and walked. When Jesus healed, he completely heals. But for us, in some ways, when with our sin nature, that healing is yet to come to complete fruition, right? There's still a sin nature we battle. There's still a lameness within each one of us that we have to surrender to the Lord again. Notice this man is praising God. I love how it says he's leaping and walking twice in the same verse, right? As if the Holy Spirit wants to enter, emphasize. And where does he go first when he's healed? He walks into the temple. He goes to the place of worship first. You want to be a person used with God this coming year? Be a person that worships. You set aside a time to worship. And I'm not talking to coming to the church. Again, these are the things the Lord spoke to me. Oh, I don't mind worshiping in the car while I'm driving, and I probably need to do that. It keeps me focused on him and not on the traffic. But do I take time to worship him at home? How can I expect to come to church and worship him once a week and him be glorified really in that? Do I worship him at home? Do I take time to worship him? Time to lift him up. Worship is not necessarily singing. It literally means to put your face in the dust before him. To recognize that you're a sinner. I don't do it enough. I pray that 2024 I'll be a man of worship. But just to let you know and to lift you up a little bit, God uses the broken. He loves the broken. He loves the weak. Peter and John did one other thing. They did not dare tread on the glory of God. All credit would immediately be given to God. All of it was focused right back to him. They were broken individuals. They knew it. They had a temper. They knew it. They were just like us. Scripture was full of people just like us. And I forget that. I think that there's this standard that I'm always trying to meet, right? I know you guys don't do that. I'm just saying it for my benefit. That, that, that as a pastor, there's this standard I have to meet. I have to be this way. I, I, I have to be just so righteous when I walk, the ground turns to gold or whatever, right? I have the little halo above my head. I, I just have to be that righteous, right? I have to know instantly the right thing to do. No, that's, that's we're human. And we fail. And there will be times the Lord will reveal right there, right then, the right thing to do and the right moment to do it. But I have to be surrendered first. The Lord uses broken people. He uses people who think they're too small, like Gideon. He thought he was too small, like David, the youngest. He uses people who think they might be too broken, Moses. Well, I stutter when I talk. I'm a murderer. He uses them. He uses people with anger problems, and I'm glad about that. He used Jonah. He used Peter. He used John. He uses people that go through depression. He used Elijah, who do after doing one of the greatest miracles of all in the Bible. I mean, when I think of miracles in the Bible, I think of the Red Sea and the fire coming down from heaven, right? They're the two big ones. And there's Elijah after doing it, running for his life, hiding in caves, caves, saying, Lord, just strike me dead. The Lord has to feed him because he's not even taking care of himself. He's sunk into this heartfelt depression. Sometimes we want the big miracles, but look, at this is Elijah, right? This is the prophet of prophets. When you think of prophets, you think of Elijah. And he's in caves begging for the Lord to strike him dead, threatening the Lord, saying, if you strike me dead, you're now a nonprofit organization. No, nobody laughs. No, I'm Non-prophet, he's the last prophet. Oh, boy. Come on. <laughs> but God uses the broken. Look at David. Read the Psalms, how depressed he is. <clears throat> you got lust, porn issues. Look at Samson, David, Solomon. By the way, Pornography issue didn't start with the internet. It started long, long before that. 
Scripture was full of people with problems and issues, and God uses them in any ways. The number one thing is to be surrendered. Isaiah would say in six, Isaiah 6, 5, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Peter first meets Jesus, he would say, he fell down at his knees saying, depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. God uses the broken, he uses the surrender. And you know where he likes to use the broken? In their brokenness. Your brokenness is your testimony. And it's usually the thing we want to hide the most, right? I've confessed to you guys many times, I, I had a porn issue. That's my brokenness. And in that, the Lord used that, and I've seen men get healed. I've, I've seen the Lord doing works in other men's lives. In brokenness is where your testimony is. Don't be afraid to expose your own brokenness. That's your testimony. Because what you're really saying is, I am broken. And I just read through when we talked about all the men in the Bible that God used. They were broken just like us. They were a mess just like us. And God used them anyways. So surrender and continue to surrender to him. I worked for a linen company for a number of years, and it was this time of year that they would contact me and say, I would, I would deliver to gyms where they would get all kinds of towels and everything. And it was right at the end of de December, they would say, hey, in January, triple our order. Because the amount of people that comes to the gym is about to triple. And they go, we'll let you know by the end of January, we'll probably dial that in half and March will be back to normal. That's the extent of New Year's resolutions. They usually last through about January. You're lucky if they get into February. Because we're whimsical, aren't we? We get passionate about something like Peter and we charge in first. All right, it's a new year, Lord. I'm going to surrender. And by January 4th, we're like, oh man, I'm through the Bible through the year. I totally... I'm two days behind already, and it's only the fourth. Aren't we? That's, that's the way we are. But he's faithful. So when you fail, look to him. Don't dwell in your failure, because you're going to fail. We're not going to be faithful. We're not. We're sinners. Surrender again. And if you're doing through the Bible through a year, pick up. Just pick back up. Don't try to catch up. Because you never, ever will, right? We know that happens at the end of the year. You know, you're getting, you're halfway through the year and you're still in Genesis. So you're like, what am I doing? No, just pick up where you were. Just keep going. Just be faithful. Just be surrendered and keep going. Because that's what he asks of us. The problem is, is when we beat ourselves up. And we remain in 2023 when it's 2024. We remain in the past when God has something new for us this year. And we're all trying to, to, to reline ourselves back up, to be faithful again. No, just pick back up. Just get back up because that's what grace does. It picks you up and dusts you off and put you back on your feet and you keep walking by the blood of Jesus Christ because you're looking toward the cross. We're going to fall. We're going to fail. But that's why the cross is there. <clears throat> so in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk when you fall again. Cling to him, look to him, not to self. <clears throat> verses 9 and 10, and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And I love that. All saw him. He was a fixture there. Forty years laying at the gate. They saw him day in, day out, and there he is walking around. Again, it's your brokenness is your testimony. And I, it says he was leaping. You know, they didn't really have a word for skipping, but I bet he was just skipping through the temple, you know, and I can see in my head because I grew up in the church, there's the, the, the religious guys coming up, no skipping in the temple courts, right? Because that's what we do, right? We yell at our kids when they're running and having fun and being crazy. It's the same thing here. This is the first time this guy gets to use his legs and I bet he's jumping and skipping and running around. But it says later on that he's holding on to Peter. And that word hold is the military cuffing. It's the idea he has been been chained to him. He is holding on to Peter, and I bet he's just holding on to his robe, skipping and jumping, and it says he's praising the Lord. <clears throat> and it says all were filled with wonder and amazement. You want to be a person used of the Lord? Use your testimony. Use your testimony, however small you think it is, however weak you might think it is, 
you might have not been, a, you know, I went to tons of Bible camps and, and different things growing up, and I heard all the testimony of the, of the gangbangers, right, and getting saved and getting from, you know, shooting at people and doing drugs and doing all the crazy things they do and getting saved. But sometimes it's, it's the kids in the church that need to hear, hey, I was a kid in church and I just messed up, right? Because there's, there's always this weird thing of us we envy, right? Even that amazing transformation testimony of this guy. Now, Chuck Smith would said, any dead fish can float downstream, but it takes a strong and a living fish to go upstream. You want to fight the current of the world, you got to be a strong and you have to be a living fish, right? That was his point. But use your testimony. You want to be a person used of God, use it. In Revelation, it says that they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Use your testimony. Because what's interesting, we will often look to the world for our value, won't we? We'll look to our jobs, our hobbies, our skills, relationships, and we'll use them to define us. Because if we don't have Jesus at the center point and the focus of everything, it becomes everything else that we're trying to get. How many men have committed suicide or fell when the stock markets crashed because their whole identity was wrapped up in that? Or their career falls apart and, and, and they're just depressed and a mess because all of it was wrapped up in that. It should be wrapped up in Jesus. Look to him. Make him the sinner. So here's this guy. He's walking, jumping, skipping. That's his testimony. He was lame and now he walks. <clears throat> we see Peter and John used by God. Again, I want to be a person in 2024 used by God. And here are a few things we've seen so far. For one, Peter and John knew God. They had had an intimate and a current relationship with God when this happened. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were men of prayer. They were men of worship, men of faith, and they gave all God all the glory. Now, they did this miracle, and if you remember in Acts, and we'll get there with Paul, when he does a miracle, they start claiming he's a god, right? They're saying, oh, you must be one of the one of the gods that came down. It would have been very easy, I think, for Peter and John to take the credit and open up, and I, I wrote this down because I thought it was funny. They could have started the PB&J Healing Emporium in Jerusalem, right? Peter and John, and I just threw Barnabas in there too because he's coming later. So the PB and John healing emporium there in Jerusalem, come get your hands laid on and be healed. But they did and all glory went to God. It was completely about him. It was not about them. It wasn't about their miracle. It wasn't about their gifting. People emphasize their gift. That's my gift. No, that's a gift you were given. <laughs> you have no power in and of yourself. God gave you that gift. It's all his. It's his credit. Give it all to him. Take none for yourself. That's what he asks. Because he doesn't share his glory. He makes that very clear. And why would you want it? Really, why would you want it in the long run? So they didn't, they didn't touch the glory of God. Verses 11 to 12 now is the lame man who was healed, held on to Peter. That's our word there. He held on like a military holding, like he was seized. And all the people ran together and them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Again, all glory, all honor, all praise, all adoration, everything went back to Jesus. You want to be used by Jesus in 2024, make sure all the glory, all the adoration, everything that goes right and everything that goes wrong is given to his glory. The other thing they did is they spoke in truth. You want to be a man or a person used in 2024, speak truth. And today, truth has a cost, does it not? It might cost a relationship might cost a family member. might cost our jobs. I'm almost waiting for it, right? Somebody at my work is going to sit there and start listening to my sermons, which will be cool. That'd be nice. If some high goes up to some higher up and they hear me say the wrong thing about LGBTQ or gay marriage and saying, no, that's sinful. And that's it. I'm out. We're just buying a house now. That would be tragic. But God's in control, right? I'm not going to bend the truth for anyone. That's what so many are doing today. I'm surprised we don't see more people with scabs on their ears. Because it says in the end times that they're going to seek teachers that, you know, itch their ears. 
You ever itch yourself so much you get a, you get a scab? I'm surprised we don't see a bunch of people walking around with scabbed ears. I watch too much YouTube, and I tell you what, the things people are saying are through the wall. You can hear anything you want. They will twist scripture any way you want it. They will twist it, turn it, and turn it into a nice pretzel with you, and you can eat it, and you'll be happy and go and feel really good about yourself. But that's not what it says here. Peter did not bend on the truth. When we get to it next week, he looks at him and said, this Jesus whom you killed, he's going to point him right out, and you let a murderer go. He points it right out to him. He doesn't stop, and you know very well that they would have taken him and stoned him, and he didn't even care. His life was not his own anymore. He was completely surrendered. You want to be a man used by God, be completely surrendered. Be honest. And Peter will fire off at them. He'll tell them that they missed their Savior, that they missed their Messiah. He'll end, in, in well, not end, halfway through this sermon, and I love this. Repent, he'll tell them. Not a popular word again today, therefore, and be converted. Wait a minute, you're telling Jews to be converted? That's what he's saying, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Peter doesn't hold back, not one bit. When God does a miracle, when we see miracles in the scripture, it's because there is a message behind it. Anybody that does miracles for the sake of miracles is probably a fraud. Because if there's not a message behind it and it is not focused on Jesus, it is somebody trying to deceive somebody somewhere. And it's amazing how some people get saved and it's like all the logic just leaves their head and they're looking at these ministries of these people and say, if you give $1,000 today, you're going to be blessed. Keep your $1,000. Don't give it to them. If they don't point to Jesus, they're not worth your time. If they don't say, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And I love how Peter ends this. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The point is, man is sinful, and he's pointing this out, but God is gracious. My last kind of point, well, two last points. Peter and John were prepared. Again, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. They were prepared for whatever the Lord was going to do, they were be prepared. And now that's what I've been asking. Lord, make me prepared for 2024, whatever may come my way. Make me prepared. And when they saw the opportunity, they took it because they were prepared. And when he says go, go full force. Go all in. Go all the way. I have this funny story. Maybe you, I find it more funny than you will, but about going and seizing an opportunity. In a compartment of a passenger train sat a young lieutenant in uniform. Next to him said, sat his commanding officer, a crusty old general. Across from him, a beautiful young lady next to her grandmother. As the hours passed, the attraction developed between the young lieutenant and the young lady. They were laughing and in talking and enjoying the trip when suddenly the train went through a dark tunnel. Midway through the darkness, the sound of a kiss followed by a slap was heard. As the train emerged from the tunnel, the four travelers looked at each one, one another with a variety of expressions. The young lady was delighted the lieutenant would kiss her at that moment, but puzzled as to why her grandmother would slap him. The grandmother was angry that the lieutenant had the audacity to kiss her granddaughter, but was grateful that the general slapped him back into line. The general was proud of the lieutenant for kissing the young lady, but confused and smarting from the slap of the young girl. The lieutenant was hardly able to contain the laughter within him, as he alone knew exactly what transpired under the tunnel. Under the cover of darkness, he had seized the moment to kiss the girl and smack the general. Maybe don't take that opportunity, but when you take the opportunity, when you see the opportunity that God provides, run, go, full in. You know He opened that door. Go, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? I want to be a man that's used by God in 2024. And what it's going to take for me to be used is surrender. And all these things I have outlined, it is just me surrendering more. I know I've said it over and over again, but that's what he hammered home in my message to me this week. That I need you to just surrender more. Because there's areas of your life you have closed off to me and I need more of it. You will be surprised what I'll do if you surrender more. And you will not regret it. 2023 was kind of hard for our family in some ways. We lost our father-in-law. 
there's a hole there. It hurts. You can never totally be prepared for loss. But I know where he is. And I know one day I'm going to go see him again. And 2024 is on its way. I don't know what 2024 holds. But as many people have said, I know who holds 2024, right? But I want to be surrendered. I want to do whatever he wants to do. I want to step forward in it. I want to be prepared. And that takes me, in practical terms, stopping some of the things I'm doing and giving more of my time, my energy, my thought over to him. The other thing I want to do is I want to make big prayers this year. Because he's a big God. And sometimes I make too small of a box in my prayers. Lord, heal this person's toe. You know, heal this. And, and, we, and we pray for those, heal this marriage. And I want to see marriages healed. But let's not put them in a box. If there's something you feel that is too big, pray it anyways. Step out in faith and pray it anyway. If it is impossible, pray it anyways. We always try to close with the men. I'm not sure if you ladies do it. We always close out praying for the lost. He can save the lost in 2024. I'm convinced he can save the lost. This world is going to get much darker. I'm not sure what's in store for this country. It's an election year. And this one looks hostile, does it not? More hostile than I've ever seen. And I mean, I haven't been around that long, but I'm around long enough to see him. This one is hostile. This country is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. It's nowhere. So either we implode or we become irrelevant. Either way is not good for us in financial sense. But I think in a spiritual sense, it's what we need. And I hate that prayer. But without loss, it doesn't seem like America gets itself back online. Remember after 9-11? Remember the churches were full again? Remember they were packed and people were praising God? They were, we were singing God bless America again. We were praying. We were thanking God again. And then what happened a few years later? You know, just like the towels in the gym was all gone again. We're so whimsical, but he is faithful. <clears throat> I pray in this country that this coming year that there's revival. But I've, I've always said, and I don't know if I got it from somebody or I made it up. I don't know if I'm that creative. When you draw a circle on the floor and you step in it, and you pray for revival in that circle till there's revival in that circle. And when there's revival in that circle, you can make that circle a little bigger. So let's pray for surrender for us. Because as we surrender, revival comes. That's a natural outcome of it. I want to see Montgomery County saved. Not a few. It doesn't have to fill this church, but I want to see the churches, the real churches, the remnant churches, the ones that are teaching the word of God, filled to the brim again. But it's going to take me being surrendered. And what the Lord sent to me as I closed out, Matt, if you in the blank. You surrendered more. Well, that's my challenge to you, too. If you surrender more, what? What? If I prayed more for my family, would more of my family be saved? If I prayed for my coworker, would more of my coworkers be saved? Would I be bolder at the workplace? I hope I didn't beat you guys up. Well, I didn't mean to beat anybody up. And again, the grace picks you up, dusts you off, and put you back on the road. Look back to the cross. So let's, let's, um, let's worship the Lord. And speaking of flexible, my first song that I picked, that I listened to three times with the lyrics up there, when I came to put it up and Kevin was here, the lyrics were gone. So being flexible, that was the God. And then I don't know, it worked, Kevin. It did work. I pressed the button, it worked, and then it didn't work be, fe be flexible, the Lord's saying. Like, I'm going to give you a little example before you start your sermon about being flexible. So be flexible. <sighs> so let's worship together.